Hi, it's me, Joan, Mainline Sociology. And before we move on to our next founding father of sociology, Max Weber, I wanted to let you know that don't think that Karl Marx developed his grand narrative and his entire plan of division, bloody revolution, all by himself. One thing we'll learn is that people may not be who they say they are. If you open any introduction to sociology textbook, there will be a blurb in there talking about the various people that you know now as celebrities or captains of industry, very famous people who changed their name because of because their other name implied or was associated with a Jewish heritage. Karl Marx is no different. If we look at his family tree, we don't have to go back too far to find out who his grandparents are. So it's actually, we go back to his great, great, great grandfather and great, great grandfather they have the surname Halevi. Halevi is a name that people had when they were associated with the tribe of Israel called Levis. So Halevi, well, who are these people? not going to go into a big bibliography of Karl Marx, but just to give you an idea that A, he's not who he says he is, and he is related directly to this particular tribe of Israel. If you're a biblical scholar, this will make more sense, but if you're not who cares? We're just, this is from the tribe of Israel. Who are these people? Here is the great, great, great grandfather, I think it is. And uh, he was an Egyptian rabbi. Hmm. Egyptian rabbi at the end of the 17th century. In 1691, he edited at Venice. Italy, his father's responsia, Dark Noem, adding a treatise of his own on circumcision, which, however, met with a great deal of opposition from contemporary rabbis. But if you are Jewish or really anyone now, you know that circumcision is a common practice cutting off the parts of babies. I won't go into that ritual right now, but we see, hmm, this man was very interested in that. As I mentioned, I also don't want to lead you down the path that Karl Marx was working alone. 
his popular associations and references go to Ingalls and Darwin. But this crowd all works together. And I chose to highlight one of these people because he is a very influential character in the field of modern psychology, as you'll see. And you'll also learn that manipulation of the senses, the hormones, and the way our brains work was very well known and studied on a massive scale. Let's say started by this man as recognized in mainstream psychology. He also is famous for his relationship with King Ludwig, who he tried to have declared insane, and they both ended up dead. There's some very interesting twists and turns, but to stay on what he did and how far he got is where I'd like to focus this. So he made many contributions in the field of neuroanatomy. What's that? Brain, the study of the structure and organization of the nervous system. In contrast to animals with, you know, symmetry, it's a, this is not a brain surgery lesson but he was interested in mapping, describing the paths, connections, origins, termini, the beginnings and endings of these neuroanatomical centers of the cranial and optic nerve networks. In other words, he knew how what you see is processed by the brain. He had all these instruments of torture. It's very, very um, barbaric, but he had a very large population to work on. Here are some of his friends. Oh, he looks like a nice guy, huh? Lot of lot of friends just to show you who these person is. I don't even know what a my mercologist, neuroanatomist is, but I do know about eugenics. So all these people were working on the goal of manipulating, first mapping, then manipulating our perception and our growths. It says he's very interested in two parts of the brain in particular that are in the center of the brain. Specifically, he was interested in the penile gland and the pituitary gland. The penile gland is probably something that you've heard of 
because it's also known as the third eye. And as you see, we could go down the road of putting fluoride in the water because that calcifies the penile gland and, and disconnects us from a big part of our own selves. The penile gland is responsible for our rest, our moods, And it's a very big deal for something to be destroyed. And it's something that's a very big deal for van gluten. The other part is this one, the pituitary gland. And this is responsible for growth, for our sexual development, male, female, it controls all the hormones. Now, in this diagram, they talk about, you know, testosterone, estrogen, um, those are the, uh, the popular ones, oxytocin, but there are hundreds of hormonal interactions that go on and these regulate our bodies in a lot of ways it's very very complicated but we know that adding extra hormones or taking away hormones changes everything you flood your body with estrogen uh, using birth control pills it will stop you from being able to get pregnant, uh, you know, progesterone, oxytocin. I mean, it's just a big subject, but keep in mind, we're only talking about what this guy knew and how he knew it is a very grand deal. Just to finish up and uh, about this man in general, death and legacy, fascinating. King Ludwig and Gluten were both found dead in the water. drowned, murdered, who knows, but Gluten was trying to declare Ludwig insane for more or less a, a, a lot of reasons, but what's interesting and I wanted to point out for is that King Ludwig was said to have built this famous castle that is used by Walt Disney as he built replicas of this castles in his theme park. Just as an interesting fast fact. And gluten didn't do too badly for himself either. This is his home. And here is a historical diagram that he had made of the brain. How did he know so much? This is fascinating and horrifying. Now let's go back a little bit to the Spanish conquistadors who are also in on this. And if you'll remember from school in 1492, 
Columbus sailed the ocean blue. We know that he and his conquistadors Conk came over here and conquered and murdered and imprisoned for, I'm going to say right now, till 1800. Okay, how do we know that about what they conquered? They say, oh, well, there are 500 native tribes that lived here. What they didn't tell you, maybe, is that these 500 or who knows how many groups of people lived in glory and splendor that looked a lot like this. Well, how do we know that? How do we know that the Americas were covered with beautiful old world structures like this? And well, we know because one of the conquistadors wrote a book. And I'm sure more did, but I'd like to thank Mind Unveiled for pointing one out to me from a Spanish conquistador. He was down in the area of Mexico, this Diaz, but we do like to read his account. Uh, you can get this at chnm.gmu.edu and read the whole entire thing for yourself. But let's just see what he said for observations when he got here around 1600. Gazing on such wonderful sights, we did not know what to say or whether what appeared before us was real for on one side, on the land, there were great cities. And in the lake, ever so many more. And the lake itself was crowded with canoes. In the causeway, there were many bridges at intervals. In front of us stood the great city of Mexico. And we did not even number 400 soldiers. And then he goes on to say, yeah, you know, it was a little bit scared because they, the civilizations there said, don't come here because we'll kill you. Well, I don't blame them, right? Of course they have to kill these people. They came to rape, pillage, burn, kill, all that stuff, right? But we have an account of the of firsthand conquistador where he describes the gardens, the temples, the animals, the beautiful, beautiful, peaceful, prosperous uh, civilization that they had encountered when they came here around 1600. 